All right, so welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have you on this gorgeous uh, wintry day. Um, on behalf of the UCLA Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, I want to welcome you to the Schoenfeld Collection Program Series. Um, I would also like to thank the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy as acting as a co-sponsor of this event. Um, please note that books will be available for purchase after the event where we will be hosting a full reception on the north balcony. So I'll issue that reminder again. We're going down there, not into the ancientists over here. Um, and we encourage you to join us for that. Um, I also want to thank the, the amazing Lee Center staff for all of their work making this event happen. Um, and please do take a moment to silence your phones. Um, there's also information available about our other upcoming events in the back as well. Um, my name is Caroline Luce. Um, I am a program director at the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. Um, and for about 10 years, I was the co-curator of Mapping Jewish Los Angeles, um, one of the Levy Center's digital initiatives. Um, and it is my honor today to introduce our speaker, the Honorable Zev Yaroslavsky, a great friend of the Levy Center, um, and what I might call a super Bruin, <laughs> a UCLA alumni in many different capacities and ways and current member of our staff, um, who will be speaking about his new political memoir, Zev's Los Angeles, From Boyle Heights to the Halls of Power, in which he documents his 40 years as a public servant here in Los Angeles. Uh, Zev served on the LA City Council from 1975 to 1994 and on the LA County Board of Supervisors from 1994 to 2014. He is the son of Ukrainian Jewish immigrants from Kapuch, right, in Belarus? So at least one uh, side of the family. Uh, <laughs> My grandfather's from Kopach. We'll talk more about Belarus yeah. later, I'm sure. Um, uh, Ukrainian Jewish immigrants raised in Boyle Heights and later the Fairfax district and cut his teeth as an organizer in the student movement to save Soviet Jewry. As a city councilman and supervisor, he combined his activist passion and fierce independence with a seasoned politician's skill to challenge the region's power brokers and was at the forefront of many major issues, including transportation, the environment, land use, healthcare, and cultural arts. Among his many accomplishments, which are detailed in this book, available for purchase, um, are that he fought the LAPD's excessive force and political intelligence gathering policies, led an effort to ban local taxes from funding the 1984 Olympics, teamed up with President Clinton to avert a catastrophic county bankruptcy, helped develop LA's modern transit system, won a bruising battle with real estate interests to save the Santa Monica Mountains from overdevelopment, and was pivotal in the creation of the Walt Disney Concert Hall and the modernization of the iconic Hollywood Bowl, all of which he discusses in great detail. And I will just say this book is, as an LA person, this is a wonderful primer on the way our city government works and 40 years of history. Um, Zev's Los Angeles has earned praise from Mayor, and Kay or ba Mayor, hello, Mayor Karen Bass, who called it, quote, a compelling history of a city's last century as conveyed through the life of one of our most impactful leaders. Um, and from U.S. Senator Alex Padilla, who called it, quote, an uplifting and inspiring journey of personal faith, public service, and the shaping of Los Angeles. Zev currently serves as the director of the Los Angeles Initiative at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs and the Department of History, and is also affiliated with the National Democra Democratic Institute in Washington, D.C., engaging in election observation and democratization projects in new and emerging democracies. Zev is going to deliver some prepared remarks, then we'll have a little bit of a Q&A with some questions that I have, um, and then we'll open it to the floor. So please do hold your questions, maybe write them down, and I'll do my best to come back to them at the end. Until then, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Zev Yaroslavsky. Thank you. You know, the, when I'm called the Honorable, uh, I'm reminded of one of the first letters I got after I got elected in 1975 from a high school classmate of mine uh, who was a polemicist of sorts, and he addressed a letter to the Honorable Zev Yaroslavsky, and it said, Dear Honorable Yaroslavsky, I knew you when you were not honorable. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the people in this room knew me when, when I was not honorable. Um, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, and uh, I'm Delighted to be here and uh, both 
today for this event and, uh, and also just generally for the last eight and a half years uh, to, be, to come back to my alma mater and do some teaching, do some public opinion survey work, and being around some really smart faculty and even smart students. And my dad was a teacher who used to tell me he learned more from his students than he did than they learned from him, which I thought was uh, a bunch of nonsense. But uh, actually, having taught here now for the last eight years, I, uh, I understand what he says. I learned a lot from my students, uh, certainly about social media. <laughs> I don't know what, and, and a lot of other things. So. Uh, thank you for uh, for this. And what I want to do uh, is not go through the book uh, in a TikTok way, but but to tell you uh, why I wrote it, um, what guided me as a as a person and as a public official. And really, uh, most of my personhood was as a public official. I was elected when I was 26 years old. Uh, I was a public figure of sorts when I was uh, leading one of the leaders of the movement to free Soviet Jews. Uh, so basically most of my adult life uh, has been in a quasi-public or public, uh, public role. And uh, I wanna tell you what guided me in these, in these things. And uh, some of them are anecdotal and some of them are you know, well thought out. I have no prepared remarks, uh, <laughs> you'll be happy to know. Uh, uh, you, you would be put to sleep if I wrote out, the last speech I wrote out was my bar mitzvah speech. So, <laughs> It was pretty good for, for a 13-year-old. Um, I wrote the book, uh, I'm, I'm trained to do two things in life. One is to run, uh, to physically run. I was on the Fairfax High School track and cross-country team. Uh, I lettered in my senior year, got my letter three weeks before I graduated high school, so I'm very proud of that. But uh, it taught me a lot about discipline and you know, you, you get out of something what you put into it. And uh, certainly that's the case in, in, in run, running. And I've, maintain that habit and that hobby for a long most of my most of my life and the second thing i was trained to do is to be a, a, a an historian uh, i came here to ucla in 1967 in the spring of 1967 as a freshman and um, uh, i came as a mathematics major because that's what all Jewish kids did at Fairfax High School is they were mathematics or science majors and they were looking forward to going into the space program and to design missiles and stuff like that. And some of my colleagues at, in high school actually were pretty smart. I wasn't one of those who was scientifically endowed. Um, and uh, some of them went to Caltech, some of them had articles on the cover of Scientific American. I walked into my first calculus class and looked around and I said, these people all look like the smartest people in my math classes at, at Fairfax and I, you know, who am I trying to kid? I can't compete with this. And they all had, you know, the, the, the plastic thing in there with their 5,000 number two pencils. And, and uh, so I decided to make a political decision to synthesize my so-called math background from high school with the social science and I became an economics major. And then one day, I, I, uh, the Vietnam War was raging, and I wanted to be well-educated in the Vietnam history, so I decided to take a course in history, uh, history of Southeast Asia, with Professor Sar Damodar Sardesai, who, was, who became a lifelong friend, passed away a few years ago, and uh, walked into the class uh, expecting uh, to learn something about, so I could art, art articulately argued the, against the Vietnam War, and he, he announced that the class was History 156A, the history, the history of Southeast Asia from prehistoric times to the 10th century, <laughs> which is not what I had in mind. Um, but of course, I couldn't w get up and walk out. It would have been terribly disrespectful. So I sat there for 50 minutes and took notes, and uh, his lecture w brought prehistoric Southeast Asian history to life. It was like watching the National Geographic documentary, and uh, and I never had a history teacher like that. The Fairfax High School teachers, Paul, you know this, uh, were boring. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, this guy just was the antithesis of that. So I decided to take 156B and 156C, and 156C, of course, is the one that I was really interested in. And all of a sudden, I realized I was a third of the way to, to, a, to a double major. So I double majored in history. And, and economics, and then uh, I was convinced to go into the doctoral program in the history department. Uh, showed the bad judgment of the history department, uh, and the bad judgment I made 
to think that I would go on all the way to a PhD in, in history. And after picking up my master's uh, in four quarters, uh, I realized uh, that I did not want to spend the rest of my life in a library reading colonial office minutes. And uh, the hardest thing I ever had to do was to tell my professor, my so-called doctoral committee chair, or would have been if I had gone on, uh, that I was going to quit. And, uh, and he, uh, no Mr. Holland's opus, you know, he didn't beg me to stay. He, he understood. He, uh, he knew my, of my social action activity. I'd been arrested. My picture had been uh, on the third page of the LA Times, Sunday LA Times, being led out of the Shrine Auditorium in handcuffs in a demonstration. And he knew that this was not my passion, academics was not my passion, and uh, he wished me well and off I went. And um, when I did get elected in 1975, I got a letter from uh, Professor Galbraith, which uh, used to, I framed it, it was up over my desk. It said, Dear Mr. Jaroslawski, congratulations on your election. Uh, the British Empire's loss is Los Angeles gain, and I hope the city is in better shape than the Empire is at this time. And uh, um, now, how did I get there? Uh, I uh, I was born in Boyle Heights, born and raised in Boyle Heights for the first eight years of my life. Uh, my parents were uh, immigrants from the Ukraine. They met in New York. My mother came here in 1923 with my maternal grandfather and grandmother. And I won't say any more about that story, but. It's, it's a really quite a story about my grandfather and grandmother. And, uh, but my grandfather was a, uh, uh, and, and my dad came here in 1921 at the age of 19. Although when he came here, his immigration documents show that he was 16, uh, which if it was today, he would be a, I'd be a DACA person. Uh, he, he came here, it seems to me, I have never pursued it, I, I intend to someday to find out why he would have said he was 16 when we know he was 19, whether it may have, may have been easier for him to come into the country or it may have made it easier for him to leave uh, Russia, revolutionary Russia, one of those two things or both. Uh, he came in under the name of Elizabeth Holtzman's uh, grandparents. Elizabeth Holtzman was a congresswoman from Brooklyn uh, who, among other things, uh, is well known for being on the impeachment committee, the Judiciary Committee that, uh, that voted to impeach Richard Nixon in 1972. And Liz and I are, are very good friends and, uh, and, and she directed me to the fact that my dad came in under their family name, not under his name. And I found him on the manifest. And so, uh, but my maternal grandfather was a, uh, uh, it, to, to put it, Bluntly, if there was one person I would like to meet, uh, he died eight years before I was born. If there's one person I would have liked to have met in life, it would not be Moses or Jesus Christ or uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it, would, it would have been my maternal grandfather. He was, he was a genius, literally a genius. He had uh, a capacity that did not trans transfer to this generation. Uh, physics and f physics experiments and concepts and he drew a model for a helicopter not knowing that Leonardo da Vinci had done it 300 years earlier. Uh, he, was, he was just an interesting guy in that way and he, he was basically a, a, a Hebrew teacher in Ukraine. He, he, the cheder, for those of you who know what a cheder is, it kind of after school uh, school and, uh, and he would regale them uh, in experiments in physics and chemical experiments and things like that. They were much more interested, the students were in that than they were in studying Torah and Talmud. Uh, and, uh, but what's significant about him is he was part of that generation that converted Hebrew uh, from a language of scripture to a, uh, which it had been for 2,000 years, uh, to a, a language uh, that was a functional language. There was no word for toilet in, in the Bible. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. Uh, in Hebrew uh, and so forth. So he was part of that generation that made this a living language, a functional language, and that's what he did for a living. And he was also a labor Zionist, a progressive socialist Zionist, uh, part of that movement that included people like David Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir, and, and, and he, where he settled finally after moving around Ukraine for a while was in the city of Poltava, which is the hotbed of labor Zionism in those days. and. Uh, uh, and so I've been fascinated by his story and, and, uh, 
uh, it, it, he's had a tremendous influence on my life, uh, even though I never met him, uh, because I know his story. My parents put together a book about him after he died, and everything I know about him, I know from, from what they put together in that book. And there were a lot of writings, letters he wrote back to his buddies back in the old country. Uh, and the one that I love the most was a letter that he wrote to a friend of his in, in Poltava, where he was complaining about his students in New York, and, you know, eight and nine year olds. He's teaching scholarly Bible and commentary to eight and nine year olds, uh, which is a fool's errand, but he, that's what he did. And uh, he says they don't behave, they, 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 they don't listen in class, they, they, they throw things around the classroom, and, and he described uh, chaos. And he says, the only thing these kids, this is mid-1920s, he says, the only thing these kids seem to care about, these boys seem to care about, is this game called baseball. And I said, I can relate to that. Uh, and so, so he was, he was a, a guy who, had, uh, who, who thought about, who, who, who lived a life that was bigger than himself and had a tremendous impact on, on people who ended up going to Palestine in the 20s and 30s and became leaders in, in that country in one field or another, and some of it in politics. Uh, he was a, a delegate to the Zionist Congress of 1905, 07, 09, and 11. Uh, he just was this big, larger than life figure in my life. And a lot of what I, uh, what I think about when, I, when I've thought about all my life is about you know, my ancestors, and especially him, because I know so much about him, and uh, you know a lot less about other ancestors. So when I ran for office, uh, and, and so when I decided to write this book, it was uh, from the perspective not as a vanity project, um, but as, as a history project. Uh, every, every fact in this book is documented. Uh, I've got three boxes of, of packed documents if we had footnoted everything, it, the, the footnotes would have been longer than the book. Uh, and I, I believe that people who, who lead a consequential life in whatever life, walk of life uh, they were in, not just politics, but in any walk of life, in community service, survivors of the Holocaust, to tell their story. Because once they go, nobody's going to tell their story. Somebody may tell a story about them, but it won't be their story. And I felt very strongly that people who were in, that Roz Wyman, who was a councilwoman, two council people before me in, in the West Side, I begged her to write a memoir. She was a very consequential public servant, uh, controversial, but, but consequential, and she just didn't, at her age, uh, didn't, didn't have uh, the energy to do it. And, um, uh, but I wanted to do it, and I've been thinking about doing it for a long time, and it was just a line for me, you know, when I leave office, I, maybe go back and do some teaching, and I want to write a memoir. And then in 2016, I, I actually researched this myself. This is the first <laughs> email that I had, that I wrote about, about the book with uh, the guy who I wrote it with, uh, Josh Gitlin, uh, who used to cover me in the LA Times. Uh, and his wife, before she was his wife, uh, they met when she was working for me, was my press secretary from 1980 to 82. Uh, uh, the first email was in March of 2016, so this was a project that took about seven and a half years, seven years and four months, and uh, interrupted by the passing of my wife. Uh, I couldn't really write about anything for about a year, a year and a half. And, uh, but I wanted this to be not just a memoir about you know, what I did, but what I did in the context of the, of the, of the time. So it's, it's as much a history of the period seen through my eyes uh, it's not the definitive history. Professor Sardesai once sent me a book, uh, not long before he died. Uh, he wrote a, a history of India, and the title of the book was, uh, the, the, I think it was, The Authoritative History of India. <laughs> and I joked with his wife at his memorial service that that was a great title, and she says he, he despised that title, but the publisher decided that was the best title they could have. This is not the definitive history, uh, definitive history was, was the, uh, was the, uh, the title of his book. Mine is not a definitive history of Los Angeles, uh, but believe it or not, there are very few elected officials who have served in the, in the entire history of Los Angeles who have written a memoir. Uh, Tom Bradley didn't write a memoir. Uh, Sam Yorty certainly didn't write a memoir, thank God. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the, the one person of consequence who wrote a memoir was uh, uh, 
John Hanson Ford, who served as, as a county supervisor for 24 years. And his book is less a memoir than it is really a textbook about how county government runs. The, 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 the amazing thing about that book is that when you read it, if you close your eyes and you think you're in the 1950s or when he retired in 1958, uh, that nothing's really changed. The same issues, juvenile delinquency, poverty, uh, crime, this, that, and the other thing. It's, it's like you could write about, uh, the, if you were to write a, a textbook about county government, the table of contents would look very similar to John Anson Ford's. And he was a very important figure in the history of the city, but he's the only one in, of the county, but he was the only one who wrote a memoir. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Richard Alatori, wrote a, a very long and laborious uh, <laughs> uh, memoir, uh, which is basically he dictated it to somebody who never re reproduced it in print. Uh, but it's an important book, especially the early part, his, his involvement in the, Ch in the Chicano movement in the late 60s and early 70s. And I told Richard, uh, who I served with for six or seven years in the city council, seven years, um, that uh, I thought it was a very important book, uh, at least from my perspective, that the early part of his life, I knew nothing about that. And, uh, uh, and I, didn't, I knew very little about the Chicano movement, not, not in the granular way that he described it. And uh, what became so obvious to me was that his, his life in, in activism from a different cause and a different, different perspective was not that dissimilar from my life as a, as a young activist. So, uh, but that's it. Uh, there, there, is, uh, there are no other memoirs. And uh, I mean, Richard Reardon wrote a memoir, and I will just quote Jim Newton, uh, who wrote for the LA Times for a long time. And uh, in his review of my book, uh, he talked about Eli Brosen's memoir and somebody else's memoir, I forgot. And, and then he mentioned Richard Reardon's memoir, and he said, in parentheses, he said, it just uh, make, it, it just, validates the point that you can be a good mayor and a bad author. <laughs> uh, it was a terrible book, and, uh, it, and it, which is too bad because he had a lot he could have written about. Uh, so, number one, I wanted this to be a history of the period, my life and the history of the period married together. And the second thing is I wanted this to be a book that if nobody else read it, uh, that my grandkids would be able to read it when they got older. And uh, just like my parents wrote a uh, produced a book, which was a series of essays about my maternal grandfather, and everything I know about him is because of that book. Um, sadly, I know nothing about my paternal grandfather other than the basics, where he was, what he did for a living, and where he lived, and where he died. But uh, about my, I wanted my kids to have that op that, that resource that uh, they could, you know, when they grow older, to to know a little bit about their grandfather once once I was gone. And that was it. And uh, it became a, a labor of love, uh, and uh, maybe the emphasis on labor. Uh, <laughs> uh, and let me just tell you a couple of the things that, that are kind of the themes of, of the book in my, in my life. And I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you the story, an anecdote, which is one of my favorite <laughs> anecdotes of all time. Uh, Prince, uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip came here in 1983 on an official visit. And uh, the Queen spoke at the City Council, gave a very nice eight-minute speech. Uh, she engaged me in an extensive 20-second conversation, uh, <laughs> which we were able to exchange the fact that I studied British Empire history. You know, I tried to use that educational background for some purpose. And, uh, and, uh, and then there was a big reception up at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in the Grand Hall. Uh, and, there were a thousand people there, and they were all trying to get a picture with the Queen. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye that Prince Philip was standing by himself on the side of the hall. So I took two of my colleagues who I was next to, uh, Joel Wax and Hal Bernson, and I said, let's go keep the Duke of Edinburgh company. And we walked over to him, and I said, I'm Councilman Yaroslavsky. It was Councilman Wax, Councilman Bernson. And he looked over, peered over his glasses, and he said, um, he says, I've met the mayor, and I know who he is, and I've met the supervisors, though I don't know what they supervise. And now I've met you counselors. I don't understand your system of government. So we gave him a two-minute tutorial on the state-local government relationship in California. There are 58 counties in California. Los Angeles is the biggest one, but there are 57 others. And then there are 88 cities in Los Angeles County. And the city of LA is the biggest one of them all, but there are 87 others, and some of them are pretty consequential. And, 
And there's at least two dozen school districts. There's a transit district. Uh, of course, there's a county government itself. There's uh, water districts, uh, air quality management districts, and uh, then, of course, the all-important mosquito abatement district. <laughs> and uh, at which point he peered over his glasses again, and he says, I think I now understand the genius of your system. And I, I said, really, what is it? And he says, it's designed not to govern. <laughs> and. Uh, and he kind of got it right. Uh, I wouldn't say it's designed not to govern, but it was designed not to uh, concentrate too much power in one place. And this goes back to the progressive era, the, the reform era, the second decade of the 20th century, in the 1910s and 11s, there was a big re revision of the state constitution. It's where the, the recall uh, came from and the in initiative and the uh, referendum process came from. It was, it was designed to wrest control of government, uh, especially at the state level, but also at somewhat at the local level, uh, from uh, rest control of, of government from the special interest. And the main special interest at the time was the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. And, uh, and that, so he kind of got it right uh, that by dispersing authority, you know, all of the things that I just talked about in New York City are under the mayor's jurisdiction. Healthcare, welfare, child welfare, the ports, the airport, uh, school districts, education, everything is under the mayor of New York. Uh, but in Los Angeles County, in California, uh, in every county, it, it's dispersed. Every, every county has a, a transit district and has a school district, and, et cetera. And uh, so my objective in the book was was not to explain why it's why we can't govern, but how we govern despite the fact that it's designed uh, to make it difficult to govern. And originally, my I really wanted the title of the book to be "Designed Not to Govern," <laughs> mainly because I'm in love with the story. <laughs> uh, but David Myers, who I think you know, Mark, I, he was a professor, a history professor here at UCLA, uh, who was very helpful to me in this process. Uh, so you can't have that as your title. Your whole book is about how you made government work. So you can't have a title that says it's designed not to govern. And he, he was right, and I always had this pit in my stomach. There was something wrong about that title, so we went a different direction. But, I, but there's a chapter called Design Not to Govern. I wouldn't let it go. <laughs> um, and I wanted to show how, uh, how government worked. Uh, that's number one, and, and how you make it work. And that it's not a science, it's, it's, a, it's an art. Uh, maybe a little bit of a science, but mainly an art. It's about personal relationships, it's about political relationships, it's about leadership, having the courage to stick your neck out and be willing to have it, you know, not necessarily chopped off, but attempts to chop it off. Uh, I always took on issues that were not popular, uh, were, were not so popular that every other member of the city council, the board of supervisors, wanted to take it on. I didn't want to compete for attention with, uh, with the egos, not least of which was mine, but, but I didn't want to compete with other egos. There was just enough to go around. So I took on issues in the city council that nobody would touch, especially a white politician would never touch. Uh, took on the LAPD. Um, that that kind of came from my days as a Soviet Jewry activist. I'd been to the Soviet Union three times. Uh, my first trip to the Soviet Union was in 1968. I was a sophomore here, it was the summer of 68, and I met my aunts, my dad's two sisters, in, in Kharkiv in Ukraine. Mm. But my older aunt met me in Red Square, and uh, she gave me the tour, the grand tour. And uh, in the middle of Red Square, I asked her, uh, you know, what's it like for Jews here in the Soviet Union? And you know, the, the, there was a, no question that there was kind of an official government uh, policy of, of cultural anti-Semitism. Uh, no synagogues, she lived in Kharkiv, uh, 100,000 Jews lived in Kharkiv, not a single synagogue. Uh, in my neighborhood, there are 20 synagogues within walking distance of my house, but in, in the town with 100,000 Jews, zero. And those are the kinds of things uh, that were going on. So I asked her in Red Square, what, what's it like for Jews in the Soviet Union? And she said, Shh, the walls have ears. And I'd never heard that phrase before. And I looked around, I said, what walls? You know, 100 yards away for the nearest wall. Red Square is a pretty big place. And, uh, uh, and when I got back to, you know, fast forward to my days in, in UCLA and, and beyond, uh, there, there were things that, that 
there were red lines for me, and one of them was civil liberties. Uh, I always ask my students or ask my students to ask themselves the question if they want to go into public service, and frankly, in any walk of life, is to look in the mirror and ask yourself the following question. What issue are you willing to lose your job over? Because if you can't answer that question, uh, then you probably don't belong in this business because you're going to get buffeted by stakeholders and special interests. You, you've got to have some grounding in what you believe in. And so, the, of course, my students are not stupid. They're at UCLA. So they say, well, what was your red line? And uh, I said, well, my red line was the First Amendment to the Constitution and actually the Bill of Rights. And when you take the oath of office in, in the United States and in California, you swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of California. And it's kind of, you know, you just say the words. It's like, I pledge allegiance to the flag. It's like, you don't think about it. Until you have to actually uphold the Constitution of the United States, and especially the Bill of Rights, because the Bill of Rights is designed to protect the minority against the tyranny of the majority. You know, freedom of speech, separation of church and state, um, all, all of the, the things that, most of the things that are contained in the Bill of Rights. And, uh, and as a politician, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive to keep supporting the minority against the tyranny of the majority because it's a majority that gets you elected, it's not the minority. So you've got to pick and choose your fights, but you've got to have, you've got to have some, for me that, that is a red line. So I took on the LAPD on their public, intelligence, uh, public disorder and intelligence division their spy unit that was really had nothing to do with public disorder. It had to do with the chief of police being able to monitor people's political views that differed from his own views. Uh, or uh, putting an end to the, to the chokehold in the LAPD, which we did in 1982. It's still an issue 40 years later around the country, but here we, we did it in 1982 because for 17 months or 18 months, 17 people of color had been choked out by the LAPD and died as a result. Uh, and, and even the sheriff's department didn't use the chokehold. And so I took on the issue. Nobody else would touch it with a 10-foot pole. My staff and my supporters said, don't take on the LAPD. They have ways of getting back at you. And, and there's a whole chapter in the book about how they tried to get back at me. But as I said in the book, uh, you know, after you've played hide-and-seek with the KGB, the LAPD is kind of a walk in the park. So I took on issues like that. I took on other issues. Um, and... and uh, you know, the, the Justice for Janitors movement, which, you know, was years later. Um, and again, here's a, an anecdote, uh, you know, how, how, how people's, I mean, first of all, I had the values of, of my socialist grandfather, my socialist parents, uh, around the dinner table, we talked about social justice all the time. And, uh, and um, the, uh, we had a, a, a janitor, uh, on the eighth floor of the Hall of Administration where the supervisors have their offices, who used to come to work about the time I left the office. I was one of the last people to leave my office unless I had an event I had to go to. I, I stayed there till 6.30 or 7 o'clock. And Alma, the janitor, used to come in, and I used to look at her, and, uh, and I said, geez, you know, she's coming to work, leaving her family when I'm going home to my kids. And... Uh, what, what a screwy situation this is. And, and she, she was represented by the union, she was a huge county employee, but there were thousands of janitors who worked in the private sector, in the private buildings in LA that weren't represented by a union. And the Service Employee Internet, Employees International Union tried to organize them and did organize them ultimately. But they needed, they needed leverage. They needed a, 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 somebody who would carry their water. Uh, because most of the janitors in the private sector were uh, I shouldn't say most, uh, a good percentage of them were undocumented, maybe most, but a good percentage of them were undocumented, and they couldn't challenge their employer because the employer would turn them over to the INS in those days or ICE, and so they were afraid to take them on. Uh, so they needed a guy who, you know, a politician who both had stature and who had leverage with the landlords. Many of the landlords of these big office buildings in Westwood and Century City and downtown were my constituents. Some of them were my supporters, some of them were my contributors. And I went to them and I said, what would it hurt you to give them a living wage? What would it hurt you to give them you know, uh, maternity leave, uh, sick leave, uh, not even some of the broader benefits that a public employee gets? And one of them who shall remain nameless because he's still around uh, said, you know, well, if, if we did that, we'd have to raise the rents by 1% to all of our tenants. 
And I said, really? I, I said, those law firms in Century City can't afford a 1% increase? I mean, really? <laughs> and as a re so I took on that cause uh, when nobody else really would uh, among, among my colleagues. It didn't take them long to do it. And by the way, on the police stuff, it didn't take long for some of the other white politicians, uh, even in the San Fernando Valley, to, to realize there's life after taking on the LAPD. I survived multiple elections. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 there is life after taking on the <laughs> LAPD. So those are the kinds of issues that I, that I took on. Um, I, I loved um, the, the arts, and uh, you mentioned the arts at the beginning. Uh, this goes to another factoid. Um, the reason I love the arts so much, and especially classical music, is one, I had a great uncle. My, my, uh, my great uncle from New York, he used to play the bass and he traveled with all the Saul Hirock orchestras. Saul Hirock was, was the impresario for all the big ballets from Europe, the Bolshoi from Russia, the Royal Ballet from England, the Danish Ballet from Denmark, etc. And so I was interested in him and my mother made me learn piano when I was seven years old. I studied piano. <laughs> that would be an exaggeration. I, I attempted to play the piano for three years. And then I went to junior high school. Somebody here is from Bancroft Junior High School. Uh, the, the LA Unified School District in those days had uh, music classes, orchestras, beginning woodwinds. And one of my closest friends, who was a little older than me, had played the oboe in, uh, in the Bancroft Junior High School Orchestra. I said, I wanted to do that. And so I walked in cold into the, into the uh, beginning woodwinds class, and the teacher said, what are you doing here? I said, I want to I wanna learn how to play an instrument. He says, well, we're looking for an oboist. So here's an oboe. Go into the cubicle, see if you can play a C major scale, and when you do, when you think you're ready, come on out. Took me a day, and I figured it out, and the rest, as they say, is history. So when the Disney Concert Hall project was on its light, was on life support, we had, they couldn't raise the money to build it, even after Mrs. Disney made her major lead, don't, uh, uh, lead gift. Uh, the CAO of the county came in to see me and said, we're gonna have to pull the plug on the, on the Disney Hall project. And, uh, and as she's saying this, uh, I'm saying, I, I'm feeling, and I, I know this sounds kind of cheesy, but it, it really happened, and it really happened to me. I felt the presence of my great uncle and my and Mr. Williams, my beginning woodwinds teacher, uh, and my mother making me sit down at the piano and learning how to how to appreciate classical music. And I said, if they were sitting here listening to this conversation, and I said to Sally Reed, I understand. Uh, we can't. We don't have the money to build it. We got to pull the plug and do something else with the property. If I had said that, they would have chopped my head off. <laughs> and as a result, at that very moment, I said to her, that's that's a non-starter. I said, uh, that's surrendering to the elements. We had had a civil uprising after Rodney King. We had an earthquake in 94. We had a recession, two recessions in the 90s. I said, we can't, you know, we can't surrender. And, uh, and as a result, and, and she was testing the waters with me because she knew I was a cultural freak. And, and uh, if, if I had said pull the plug, she would have gone down the hall and talked to the other supervisors. But when she heard it from me, and, she, and I was also a fiscally conservative kind of a guy. I was a, person, a progressive who believed in paying his bills. And she knew that if I wasn't going to go for this, nobody else would go for this. And, uh, and that ended it. And so, what, 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 I mean, I'm not that vain, but I would like to offer the, the possibility that Disney Hall got built because the LA Unified School District offered classical music mm -hmm. training in the seventh grade to students. Because I wasn't very good. Uh, when I tried to blow an A, it came out as a B flat. So it was a very embarrassing kind of experience for me. But the fact that I that I appreciated the arts and I appreciated this particular art form made made a difference. And who knows what the you know, where the train would have taken us otherwise. Those are some of the things I talk about. Uh, the, the last thing I'll I'll say, and then I'll open it up to your questions, um, is uh, again I, I I'll bring up a British historian. There was a British historian by the name of Lord Tom Thomas Macaulay. He's a 19th century, middle of the 19th century. He actually was a, served in the Parliament of Great Britain for a short time, but he's known as a historian. And he had a line that I read early in my career that really spoke to me. And the line was this. He says, no man is fit to govern great societies who hesitates about disobliging the few who have access to him for the sake of the many he never sees. Mm -hmm. And 
that's really the way I operated. Uh, you know, there, there were people who could hire lobbyists and who could hire lawyers and could hire consultants, and they knew how to get to me or my staff. Uh, but it was the people who couldn't hire them that really were my were my charge. Uh, Harry Truman had a similar line. He said that the when he was president, he said there there are 15 million Americans who are represented by associations and federations and consultants. He says the other 165 million Americans are the responsibility of the president of the United States. And when I became a county supervisor, and a county is basically about people who are on the economic margins. These are not the well-to-do people. Uh, these are the people who rely on the county for a welfare check, or, or their kids have been abused, or the kid has been abused, or they're incarcerated. It's, it's not a lot of positive stuff at the county. Most of the county budget is in, is in the troubled part of our society, serving the troubled part of our society. Uh, those are the people we never see, homeless people. We never saw until they started showing up all over town. But when they were down in Skid Row, we had policies, and I was a part of it, we had policies called the containment policy uh, that uh, you know just confined the, the homeless to Skid Row and its environs, and as long as they stayed there, you know, out of sight, out of mind, uh, that that's the way, you know, that would be enough. Uh, but when they started showing up in Pacific Palisades, uh, and in Las Feliz, and in, you know, around Beverly Hills, it became a different story. And uh, so it's about the people we never see. And that's what guided me for most of my, uh, all of my career, is especially as a county supervisor. I remember telling my chief of staff, I, I, I said, you know, the phone never rings here. You know, in the county, the phone, in the city, the phone rings all the time. I mean, people just call you to see if you'll return their call, just for the fun of it. Uh, and they're pretty affluent mostly, and you know, they're, they're pretty spoiled when it comes to wanting to get a response from, from their government, as they should be. Uh, but in the county, it was all about poor people, and the poor people didn't have the time to pick up the phone and call. Uh, they certainly couldn't hire a lawyer or a consultant. Um, aside from which, they couldn't find my phone number because they couldn't spell Yaroslavsky. <laughs> a real problem. And, and so I told my chief of staff, I said, we're not getting any calls. This is kind of troubling, and, and we know we have a constituency out there that depends on us. We can see it in the reports we get every day. Uh, so we're going to have to go out there and figure it out and then reach out to them and, uh, because these are the people we never see. And we won't see them unless we open our eyes to them. And that's what guided me uh, really uh, as, a, as a public servant. And the last thing that guided me was a quote that I will give you from uh, uh, the historian Barbara Tuckman, who wrote a, a, a lot of books, and they're all great books, but the one that got to me uh, was, was written in kind of mid-career of mine. Uh, it was called The March of Folly. And, uh, it, and it's, a, it's a great book. If you've never read it, it's, it's really accessible. It's not, no offense to the academics, it's not <laughs> dense and scholarly. Uh, it's a, she tells a story about, you know, four examples of how uh, leaders, world leaders, ended up doing the wrong thing because uh, because they engaged in folly, and she defined it folly as a perverse persistence in a policy that was demonstrably unworkable. That was one definition. The other one was, faced with incontrovertible evidence that the course you are on is the wrong course, you persist in it anyway. And I can't tell you how many times, I said, basically, to translate it into the vernacular, is when you're on the wrong course, cut your losses. And you, the, the price you pay eventually for making the wrong decision uh, is much more uh, costly than whatever price you pay for changing your mind. And she used a, a bunch of examples. Vietnam War was one of them. The American Revolution, she said that the, if the King of England had not been so contemptuous of the colonists, we'd still be, we'd all be singing God Save the King. It was, when she wrote it, it was God Save the Queen, <laughs> and, uh, and so forth. And, and she, you know, others that are well known to historians, uh, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, uh, the, the, I think it was a chief of staff who told the prime minister, don't, don't do it. Uh, it, the famous words, you will awaken a sleeping giant. He ignored that advice. Uh, and, and there are tons of them. Uh, the papal reformation she used as an example. Uh, I tried to, to learn from history, and this goes to the Luskin Center for History and Policy, one of the reasons I love uh, what, what they do. Uh, in, the, in the work that they do, is to learn from 
both the successes and the failures in history. There's no, in, in academia, if you reproduce somebody else's work product, it's cheating. In politics, it's research. <laughs> and so there's nothing, there's no shame in, in looking at what works in embracing that and applying it in your neck of the woods. That's what I did on homelessness. I went around the country talking to cities and counties. How did you make it work? In New York, in Denver, in a bunch of places. Uh, and, and just, you know, try things and be willing to, you know, be willing to fail. It's one of the things that I like about Karen Bass in, in her declaration of emergency on the homelessness issue. Uh, she's coming up on her first year anniversary. There'll be a lot of discussion about how her first year was. I think her first year has been pretty damn good for given all that's going on in this town. When she declared a state of emergency, people asked me, well, what does that really mean? And, you know, well, it gives her some, on the margins, it gives her some additional authority to expedite things and permits and stuff. But that's not, that's not what, that's not what's meaningful about the declaration. What's meaningful about, meaningful about the declaration is that she decided to say, I'm in charge. This is my issue. I'm going to wear it. You judge me by the results uh, over the next four years. And, uh, and no other mayor did that. No other mayor would have even contemplated doing that. She just took, she became her own homeless czar. And, uh, and she's making a difference. It's not, it's certainly a long way to go, but for the first time in a decade and a half, I can actually say that I feel like the, the battleship is starting to turn in the right direction. And there's an old saying, nothing succeeds like success. So if she gets, if she has some successes and people will become less cynical and more supportive of what the body politic is trying to do, that's leadership. That's what, you know, she chose to lead. Uh, that's part of the whole mosaic. So that's it. Let me stop and open it up to any questions you have. You know, I have to say, um, while those were not prepared remarks, they are full of the same candor and humor and wisdom as this entire book. So to plug again, the book is for sale <laughs> at the reception no afterwards. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so. As I said, I'm going to start off with a few questions today. Okay. Um, and the first one is a tough one, but I think it's one that is on the minds of many of us right now. And that's about the moment that we find ourselves in today. Um, Zionism is a thread throughout this book. It, of course, begins with your maternal grandfather, who you mentioned, and your parents, who are both active in Havanim. Um, and you talk a lot about the sort of deep commitments to the Jewish values of justice and tikkun olam and civil and human rights that they inculcate in you. So I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about this moment, um, anything you want to share about those of us who share your values and, and what you think we should be doing, could be doing, and the direction you see progressive Zionism headed in the wake of the horrific attack on October 7th. Yeah, look, it's, uh, uh, it's obviously the, the issue uh, within the Jewish community and beyond, uh, the Muslim community, uh, to be sure. Um, and I think there are two issues. There's, there's the Gaza war, and, and then there's the anti-Semitism that's unleashed here at home. The two are related, but they're not necessarily uh, the same thing. Uh, long after the Gaza war is over, we're going to be dealing with the unleashing of the anti-Semitism in this country, uh, which has been under, under the surface. If you read your history, go back to, World War II, and you know, up up until up until Pearl Harbor, there was a really broad base of support for anti-Semitism, not getting involved in the war, the Jewish war, and all that stuff. If you guys haven't seen the documentary that Ken Burns did on America and the Holocaust, I really recommend it. He's got one episode there where he talked where this the politics of anti-Semitism and why Roosevelt didn't bomb the, 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 uh, the gas chambers and all that stuff, it, it really is an eye-opener. It was an eye-opener to me. Uh, so th there are two issues. On, on the Gaza thing, uh, it's, a, it's a tragedy, uh, and, and I don't know how else to, to say it. And, and I don't, you know, I hear everybody being armchair quarterbacks about it. Uh, I don't like to be an armchair quarterback. I don't know what I would do. Uh, it's, it's instructive uh, that there is no dissent in Israel at, the, at this moment. 
about the policies of the government as far as what they're doing, which may come as a surprise to some and may, may be uncomfortable for some. Uh, my sister lives in Israel, has lived there since 1961. She, she made Aliyah to, to Israel uh, a couple of years after she graduated high school. And, uh, and she's a left winger. She's a, she's a Labor Party person. I think there are 10 people left in the Labor Party. She's one of them. And uh, don't talk to her about, about restraint. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, that this is to them, it's an existential threat. And I understand it. It is an existential threat. Um, think about it. They've got Hamas, which is the weakest of their enemies right now. Uh, on their southwest border, in the western Negev Desert. Hezbollah on the north has 115,000 or more guided missiles with guidance systems. The Hamas missiles are, you know, the old Tom Lehrer line about the missiles. Where they go, you know, he, he shoots them up where they come down. That's not my problem, says Werner von Braun. The ones they have in, in Lebanon you know, they could, they, could put them, they could put my sister's address in, into the computer and they could hit, it, hit the front door. Uh, so they're looking around them and they're seeing literally, uh, you know, how can the country survive? I mean, the people who lived in the Western Negev who were wiped out by, by the attack on October 7th, they're not going back. They're not going back there. Would you go back there? I wouldn't go back there, right? And, and, and so the, the lessons that are being learned by their, by their adversaries or, you know, you do a little bit over here in the Negev, you do a little bit, they evacuated a, a, cor a, a corridor of uh, several kilometers wide in northern Israel. They've evacuated all the cities and, and uh, kibbutzim and, and all that from, from the areas that are within artillery range of Hezbollah. Uh, there are 300,000 Israelis who are, are, have been evacuated from their homes or living with their relatives or wherever they're living. Uh, this is not sustainable to them. And they're looking at it as an existential threat, and frankly, I think it is an existential threat. As, not as a Zionist, but as just a, an analyst. If you can't, if you, if you, if you keep constraining or contracting your, your borders, and you can't live here, and you can't live there, and you, you know, then, then you don't have a country anymore. And that's the way they see it. Now, whether the response is, has been excessive or not, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to punt on that. Uh, when when they announced that they were going to have a siege uh, at the very beginning, a siege of uh, of the Gaza of, of the Gaza Strip, uh, and the siege was going to be no water, no food, no fuel. Uh, the the fuel I get, uh, the food and the water, really. Uh, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, uh, who lived in Leningrad during the war, uh, was, was a survivor of the Nazi siege, uh, the German siege of Leningrad, where one out of every three people who lived in Leningrad died of starvation. So what, what is the military rationale for that? Uh, I get the bombing. Uh, I get they want to get the guys who, who did this, and I understand, we all understand that they hide behind uh, the shield of the civilian population. Uh, but there were some things they didn't have to do, that's my, that's my personal uh, view. But, uh, having said that, uh, what's the answer to it? Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm in great despair about, about what's happened. And, and really, I mean, it, it, there's nothing one can say that doesn't get you in you know, alienate somebody or, or get somebody riled up, uh, you know, this, this should never have happened. And, uh, and there's, there's blame to go around uh, within the country and they're going to have their own reckoning in, in the months ahead, weeks ahead, uh, about that, uh, how, how this could have happened, how, how the security you know, could have been so, uh, so porous uh, on, on October 7th. But that's, that's their issue. Now, to the anti-Semitism here, uh, if there was ever any, you know, there's been, been a big debate going on in this country, uh, in a diaspora, uh, among Jews and, and anti-Semites. Uh, is being anti-Zionist anti-Semitic or not? 
I believe it is. I've always believed it is. Uh, that doesn't mean that criticism of the Israeli government, I was just critical of them, means you're an anti-Semite. But Zionism, as I say in the book, uh, in the parlance of my days as a UCLA student, is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. Just think about where, this, where Zionism came from. It, it was born at a time when there was nationalism all over Europe. And everybody had their country on the Yugoslav Peninsula in Italy was, was uh, you know, all, all their provinces were, uh, you know, the, the, the king, uh, what's his name, Emmanuel, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the wanted, wanted to get out, under the, out from under the yoke of, of Austro-Hungarian Empire. Everybody had their, their homeland, but the Jews were always, uh, they didn't, that wasn't their homeland. Right, and, and by design and by, for hundreds and hundreds of years. I remember a trip I took to, to Poland uh, some years ago and, and the rabbi, uh, the Warsaw rabbi, who was a Chabad rabbi from Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, was uh, explaining uh, the, the relationship between Polish non-Jews and Polish Jews. He says, we shared the same land but not the same history. And that's about as eloquent a way I, I, I can uh, I can say it, uh, and and so that that was that was what spawned the whole Zionist movement. Is we have a homeland, yeah, we've been absent from it for two thousand years because we were kicked out two thousand years ago. But that's we're not settler colonialists. That's we have this isn't Britain going into the diamond mines of South Africa or in Kenya or. Or, or the the Belgians in the Congo. This is this. We, there is a relationship between that land and and the Jewish people I mean, for for thousand two thousand years. I've been saying next year in Jerusalem. This is not some made up thing. So when people around this campus uh, and campuses all over country all over the country are talking about settler colonialism, I, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, that, that is suggesting that the Jews have absolutely no claim on the land. Now, is there, are there issues? Of course there are issues. Uh, there were issues when the Jews were kicked out too. There, there, there are issues that can be resolved. Uh, and this gets back to one of my other axioms of, of public service. One of the things I learned over time by experience, and uh, you know, th there's an old Mark Twain line that comes to mind, uh, that good judgment is the product of experience, and experience is often the product of bad judgment. And, uh, and, I, and so I learned by, by making my mis a fair share of mistakes. One of the things I learned was it's easier, it's better, I shouldn't say easier, it's better to negotiate with a strong adversary than a weak one. Uh, because if you negotiate with a strong adversary, that adversary can get to yes. At some point he can get to yes. The weak one can never get to yes. I learned this in negotiating with unions. You can't negotiate with with a weak union leader because he he's afraid he's going to go back to his membership and they're going to they're going to pants him. And uh, uh, so, you know, why hasn't there been you know there were opportunities? There was Oslo. There were other things. You know, the Clinton's efforts in 2000. The, the, it really comes down to it's nothing's ever this simple. But it really comes down to neither Arafat. Uh, at that time, and not, neither other leaders on the other side at another time w could get to yes. They were weak. They were, and look, look at the people who, who made peace. Uh, Anwar Sadat made peace with Israel. He was assassinated. Rabin uh, launched the, uh, with Paris, launched the uh, Oslo Accords. He's assassinated. Arafat told Clinton uh, at Camp David in 2000 that if I sign this deal, you know, they'll kill me when I go back. Uh, Michael Oren, who's a uh, historian, uh, Israeli historian, American-born uh, uh, historian, uh, who was the ambassador of Israel to, to uh, the United States, uh, wrote a book about the 67 war, and he said that, that shortly after the 67 war, there was an effort to, by the Israeli government to go to the mayors of the West Bank and try to make a deal so that they could self-govern. You know, today it would be radical to, to think of that. And the mayors told them, it's a great idea, we'd love to do it, but if we did it, we'd, we'd have our head handed to us if we did. So you've got this, this intractable problem, and I don't, I don't know what the answer is. So, uh, so you got Israel, Gaza on one side, and it's, it's horrible. Uh, 
the destruction is, is uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's virtually complete. Uh, I don't, you know, the, the, the day after, I mean, they talk about the day after politically, I'm talking about the day after, where do people go back to their homes? There is no home, Some, a lot of their homes are gone. So I don't know what the what the strategy is, uh, and we'll see. I, I don't want to prejudge, but I'm not blind either. None of us are blind. That that bothers me. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they've got to get rid of Hamas. They've got to get rid of the military apparatus of Hamas. Yeah. Yes, Hamas is an idea. Palestine liberation is an idea, but the idea is one thing. The fact that uh, any given Saturday, 3,000 people could just walk across the border and massacre a whole population uh, is, is also unacceptable. And, and just think about it, what we would do if that happened to us uh, on any of our borders. If, God forbid we ever had borders like that. So I, you know, I, don't, I don't know if that's uh, an answer, but uh, I, think, I think most Jews uh, and non-Jews, this is not just a Jewish issue, are struggling with, with this. It's, uh, we wish it hadn't come to this, but it's there, here it is. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, and I thank you for being willing to talk about it. It's a very, very difficult thing. So let's turn to a different topic now. Let's sure. return to safe local ground. Um, my favorite topic, Boyle Heights. Um, which is referenced, you know, it's in the title of your book. There are many moments throughout the book where you sort of were like, what is me, a kid from Boyle Heights, doing in this crazy situation? Yeah. Um, and I've been researching and writing about Boyle Heights for 15 years now, and I've heard that sentiment expressed over and over and over. Um, interviews with Judge Harry Pragerson, the first American Jew appointed to uh, the Supreme, or not the, the Court of Appeals, excuse me, um, Boyle Heitznick, former student body president of Roosevelt High, just yep. talks about it that way. Um, Meyer Luskin, near and dear to the Levy Center and to UCLA, talks about it that way. And our own dear Alan Levy talks about Boyle Heights that way. Um, so I'm remarkably, you know, I'm sort of infatuated by just how meaningful it is in people's identities. So, and I wondered if you could talk about that a little sure. bit. What does it mean to you? Because you could easily have titled this book From Fairfax to the Halls of Power. Right. I think a lot of people would have expected From Fairfax to the Halls of Power. Tell me why Boyle Heights, what it means to you having grown up there. Because, as any sociologist will tell you, that, you know, your first five years are very formative years in your life. And I got the privilege of spending my first eight years in Boyle Heights. Uh, what is it about Boyle Heights that, that I rem that, I mean, it's a lot of it is is uh, kind of I forget forget all the all the rough things that happened, and I remember all the nice things that happened. But the thing about Boyle Heights that was uh, special was uh, we were one of the last people in in our neighborhood to get a television set. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, we moved out of Boyle Heights in 1956. I think we got our first television set in 1955. And so if you didn't have a television set, what did you do? Uh, you had friends, and you spent time socializing with friends. You went over to their house, they came over to your house. And you, get, you had relationships that were deep and meaningful. And I think that's why you get people like Meyer Luskin and Harry, Prager Harry Pragerson used to come to my office uh, unannounced. He said, look what I found. He found a map of Ukraine, and he knew that my parents came from the Ukraine. And he said, there's a, there's a little village called Yaroslavka. <laughs> uh, that must be where your parents are. Well, no, my parents are from Yaroslav, which was in eastern Poland. Not my parents, but my, my dad's side of the family. Uh, but, but it was the first time. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing, and I still have the map. I mean, he brought me a map. This is a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals judge. He had to share it with me because there's there's just something genuine uh, and, and and real about the relationships that people had with with the community. It was also a diverse community. Certainly, when I was growing up, it was diverse. Uh, it became diverse after World War II, uh, and it was diverse be long before World War II. But the Jewish population, which was dominant there, was dominant in the 30s through the war, and then. When the war was over, the the, uh, the Jewish community started to migrate west. Um, my dad and my mom ran a Hebrew school in City Terrace, which was five minute, ten minute drive from Boyle Heights, and uh, 
they uh, they stayed there until they couldn't put a class together anymore. Uh, that was once they couldn't put a class together, it became the Plaza Community Center, which it still is to this day. I've gone back there many times, talked to the people there. I've taken my kids there. I guess I'll take my grandkids pretty soon there. They'll be able to appreciate it. Um, the school moved to third, yeah. Hmm? The school moved to third, the third street. No, it. that was there. That was the Institute of Jewish Education was there before, but but it was Boyle Heights was a place where. The, Every stripe of Jewish life, you know, communist, socialist, left-wing socialist, right-wing socialist, <laughs> uh, orthodox, you know, there was no such thing in those days to my knowledge of modern orthodox. There were synagogues galore all over the place. Um, it's, it, I mean, it's nostalgic, so I, I mean, there, there's <laughs> something nostalgic about it. But the one thing I will say that is more than nostalgic is that, you know, I, I grew up, I went to school with, with Mexican kids, uh, with uh, Asian kids, Japanese, the remnant of the Japanese mm -hmm. uh, internment that, that took place during the war. Some, the Boyle Heights was a significant Jewish, uh, Japanese American community. Uh, some of whom came back, most of whom moved on to other areas. Um, so there was a diversity in, in the community, which uh, I think has lasted with me, you know, I'm not, I'm not intimidated by people who don't look like me, or who don't think like me, who don't go to the same religious institutions as me, or who don't go to religious institutions at all. Um, so that's, and, and again, I, I come back to, I didn't have a television set, so we, we had, we <laughs> played. Roller skates? Hmm? Roller skates? No, not me, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not crazy, I'm not gonna get on roller skates, but it, it's, and it was the formulative part of my life, so I, I'm nostalgic about that, that's where I got my, you know, my, that's where I learned how to walk, and, it, and, and that's where I spent time with my parents and my sister. We, we, we shared a room. When I retired, we did a little film about my career, and one of the things I wanted to do, and we did it, is we went to my old apartment on 724 North Breed, knocked on the door, and asked the guy if he'd be willing to be interviewed and, you know, have a conversation with me. And he was... He said, love to. I had no idea, because he didn't know who I was. But when I told him <laughs> I work with Gloria Molina, he says, oh, Gloria Molina, can you, can you get that parking, that stop sign fixed? So it was, uh, it, was, it, was a great, it was a great experience. Now, my parents you know, moved to where the Jewish community had moved and lived in Martell and Melrose. Uh, my mother died when I was 10. My dad lived there until 1970. Mm -hmm. And this gets to, to what, what the uh, Luskin School talks about a lot about the housing and, and what my dad bought his house for $15,000 in 1956. Oh. And barely was able to piece it together. <laughs> Sold it 15 years later for 21.5. Oh. Made $6,500 profit and thought he had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and seven years later, that house sold for $220,000. And now it's worth a million yeah, seven. Two, it's a yeah. substandard lot. So the 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 uh, commoditization of real estate has really done us in as a society. But that was my dad's only house, uh, and he was 54 when he bought it. So it gives you an idea. Um, but it was great. I lived uh, eight blocks from Gilmore Field, where the Hollywood Stars mm -hmm. played. It was a minor league baseball team, and and that's where I became a big sports fan. So, yeah, all right, that's a long enough answer yeah. on that. No, but let's keep going with Fairfax because, you know, we got to talk about CD5. Thank you, Councilman Koretz, for joining us as well. Um, multiple generations of CD5 representation here. Um, I was cu curious to see, you know, when you were talking about why you ran in 74, part of the way you describe it is that the majority of primary voters were going to be Jewish, but that it didn't have Jewish representation, or it hadn't since Rosalind Wyman retired. No, it had Jewish. It, it, it was a Jewish district. I right. mean, it so was represented by Roz. She was the first, and then Ed Edelman, then me, then Mike Fuhr, and then Jack Weiss, mm -hmm. and then you, right? You follow Jack Woods, yeah, yeah so. and, and now your daughter-in-law, and so and I wonder, right. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what Jewish representation means in the context of a city and a county, um, and sort of how you feel like your Jewishness and/or the Jewishness of your predecessors and/or successors sort of informs local governance and what's that means. There's all sorts of s sweet, lovely little examples in the in the text of 
you know, stop signs or, or pedestrian crosswalks that automatically go so that observant Jews on a Saturday don't have to push the button yeah. and little things like that. But I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on, you know, this <laughs> being the Jewish, the That's Center for Jewish st Studies, if we're talking about theories of governance, so how does Jewishness come I, in? There? I think it's important to uh, the, the communities, you know, various ethnic and racial communities uh, have, have people at the table. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe now, but Prior to Roz Wyman being on the city council, she was elected in 1953. Prior to that, there had never been a Jewish councilman. There may have been one uh, in the entire history of the city. Um, Although there was a Jewish we, mayor. We had, for a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was not, not really, that doesn't count. Uh, the, the uh, you, you had, uh, we, did, we, we didn't have a Jewish congressman from California until 1974. Not one, okay. Maybe one from Northern California that I was called to my attention, but nothing down here. Henry Waxman and a guy from here, and a guy by the name of Krebs, Jim Krebs, from Bakersfield, of all things, were the first two Jews to be elected to the uh, Congress from California who were Jews, other than this alleged one up in the Bay Area. Uh, and, and so it goes. I mean, I, I think the Jewish community, uh, you know, the, the Fifth Council District was a predominant, I don't know, say, I don't want to say predominantly Jewish. It was, it was probably not a majority Jewish, but it was the single biggest ethnic group uh, in the Fifth District, much more so than it is today. Uh, the boundaries have changed a little bit today, but the, the district has changed quite a bit today. Uh, a lot of Jews have moved out of L.A. Um, a lot of white folks have, left, have moved out of LA. Uh, and, and this has been a trend that's been going on for since, since uh, the late 70s, early 80s. And it's a, it's a trend that's gone on in, in many other metropolitan areas in New York. New York used to have, I believe I'm right about this, three million people and it's down to two, uh, three million Jews and it's down to two million or it's two million and it was down to one million. I don't, I don't want to be held to those numbers, but a <laughs> huge number of people moved out to the suburbs and the exurbs. Mm -hmm. Westchester County to Connecticut, same thing. My daughter was went to UC San Diego, and uh, when and, and she was teaching confirmation class uh, at uh, the biggest conservative or reform temple I don't even remember in the northern part of San Diego near Del Mar, and we went down there for a weekend, and uh, this would have been when she was in college, so that would have been 19 early 90s, and uh, and and they were dedicating the new sanctuary, and. Uh, that weekend, and so we went with her on the Friday night for the service. A thousand people came to that service, and everybody was walking up to me saying, "I voted for you the first time you ran." And I said, "Really?" I, I said, uh, "When did you leave?" Oh, I left, you know, eight years ago. I said, "Why did you leave?" Well, Qualcomm. I got a job at Qualcomm. I got a job over here. I got a, schools are better here. You know, all that kind of stuff. There were, I, I bet, based on that my little sample that 20% of the people uh, came from my district. Most of the people came from LA. Mm. There weren't that many Jews in San Diego to start with. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's, an, uh, that's a change, a change in demographics. So the, the fifth district uh, is, uh, well, I'll tell you, I mean, I think I write about it in the book, that about close to 50% of the people who voted in the election in 1975 were Jewish surnamed. That doesn't mean they were all Jews. Most of them were. It doesn't mean that there weren't some Jews who did not have Jewish surnames. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are some of them too, uh, which is another story to tell in the book. Uh, but uh, today, I would say it's less than 25%, maybe 20%. But, uh, this is the voters people who vote. It's a different, it's a different ball game now. Uh, when I was on the city council, there was a time when there were seven Jews in the city council mm. at the same time. Uh, now there are two, uh, Katie and uh, Bob Umenfield. And when Bob retires, uh, or turned out uh, uh, in a couple of years, uh, you know, it, there may be only one left. Um, it's, it, it's, the natural order of things. I mean, the demographics of this region have changed. And, uh, and the demographic of the electorate has changed. Mm -hmm. you know, the elections are now held in even numbered years for the city. For many decades, they were, they were held in odd numbered years. Big difference. 
In, 19, in 2017, the turnout for the mayor's election was 17 percent, 15 percent. Yours was even less than that because, you, Paul, you were running for re-election at that time. It was a very low turnout. This last time, it was close to 40 percent. That's two and a half times the number of voters, rough give or take, uh, who voted in this election. And who are that? What is that delta? Who are those people who voted this time who didn't vote last time? They're working people, they're renters, uh, they're, they're, they're people of color. Uh, it's a different electorate now. Karen Bass probably would not have won by 10 points if it had been an, an odd-numbered election year. Mm -hmm. She might have won, but it would have been a lot closer. So there are a lot of changes that have taken place and a lot more that are likely to take place over time. I have more questions, but I just realized yeah. how late it is, yeah. and I do want to make sure we get a chance for the audience to ask There's questions, and forgive me for not having given enough space. The yes, lady please. in the back, and then I'll get to you. Okay. Uh, I, I want to know if you have any plans yet or after the program that you're in at UCLA, of course, uh, in the spring, spring summer, uh, and whatever other thing you're doing here, what are you thinking of or planning to do after? After what? After I leave UCLA? UCLA the UCLA program that you're in? Well, uh, whenever I leave UCLA, uh, I plan to do nothing. <laughs> 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 to do whatever I darn well please. Listen, I've been here, uh, it's eight and a half years at the end of this month, uh, and it will be nine years at the end of uh, June. I've loved every minute of it. Uh, you know, I've, there's some great, Mark Peterson, uh, who's a professor uh, of government, I guess, at the Public Policy School. I don't know what your official title is, but he's uh, one of the smartest people on that sixth floor of ours, which I, I treasure. Uh, Michael Dukakis used to have his office up there. No way. And uh, Chuck Young used to have his office up there when he came into town. Uh, it's, it's, you know, this is the way I wanted, you know, when I left office, uh, I did not want to become a consultant or a lobbyist. I could have made in with one client what I make here in a year. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I, I didn't want to trade on my name. And I, and I didn't and I won't. Um, if, I'm, if I trade on my name, it'll be for free. Uh, you know, so uh, I've, I wanted to come back here and fortunately, uh, you know, I wanted to teach. I wanted to do some public opinion research. Uh, the then dean of the school, Frank Gilliam and Mark, called me into my office. I didn't realize it at the time, but I, after it was over, I, th I think I just got interviewed. Uh, <laughs> I think Mark just wanted to see if I could string two sentences together. <laughs> and, uh, and the chancellor, Chancellor Block, uh, encouraged me to come. And, uh, and, and it was not a hard sell. I mean, they had me at hello. This is where I wanted to come. This place has been so important to me, uh, both intellectually, uh, it's where Barbara and I kind of, uh, our relationship flourished shortly after we started dating. She got a job in the registrar's office. Every time I walked by that corner, the northwest corner of Murphy Hall, you know, that's where she worked. And uh, so it, it, this is more than just a place where I got my degree. Uh, I had a great relationship with, with uh, Chancellor Young, uh, a, a wonderful relationship with him when I was in office, uh, which created an opportunity to do something really innovative, which is chronicled in the book about the long range plan for the UCLA mm -hmm. development, which ended up being, I, I'd like to say I thought about this and I worked, you know, this was, I, I produced a white paper and this is what happened. This is a great story. Uh, UCLA wanted to, build, wanted to build 4 million square feet of new building on campus. They had to, this is a prime, the principal public research university, one of them in the, in the world. and. Uh, and ranked number one in the, in the country. And uh, he wanted to expand it, that the university needs to expand, but the, of course the neighborhood would have, you know, four million square feet, are you kidding me? That's 75,000 daily automobile trips a day. Uh, you can't, this area can't handle it. And we didn't have any jurisdiction over UCLA because it's state-owned property. Uh, that didn't matter to my constituents. You know, you're, you're a magician, you can. So I, I had a meeting with, I, I talked to Chuck Young about it, um, you know, offline, and, and then I said, let's have a meeting with your people and, and the city people. And then I came up with an idea, which we patterned after something we did in Century City back in the late 70s. Let's phase the development. 
you're telling me you're not going to produce more than 25,000 new automobile trips a day, which is preposterous, I said. <laughs> uh, I'm saying, or my people are saying, 70 to 75,000. Why don't you, we have a memorandum of understanding that this is what I, I said this to my own traffic engineers to, to run it up the flagpole. And then I proposed it to, at this, you know, Soviet American summit meeting that Chuck convened in, in his conference room. I said, let's phase it. We'll, we'll let you build a million, I mean, we'll let you, you build them, you agree to build a million square feet. We will, when, once you occupy the buildings, we'll, occup, we'll uh, count the, the automobile trips that are coming in and out of the campus. The good thing about UCLA is there are only a finite number of ways to get in and out, so we can count them. And we'll do it in October, which is the busiest month of the year for traffic here. And then if you haven't reached the 25,000 car cap, we'll let you go to the next million and so forth. Or, and we will do, the, the city will do the count every year or oversee the count every year. So it's now, that was 1990, it is now 2023. And forget about COVID, let's go back to pre-COVID. The number of automobile trips that UCLA generates today is about the same as it was in 1990. It not only didn't get to 25,000, it didn't move off of where it was. And the reason for it was, and this is where I give Charles Young incredible credit for this, is there, was, there were two ways to cut traffic down. One is to cut four million feet down to one million feet, and the other is to build more housing for students on campus, the next to campus. And so since 1990, there's been this, this intense effort to build more student housing. So UCLA today is, at least undergraduate, is more of a, of a uh, residential campus than it is a commuter campus. When I was going to school here, 70, 80% of the people, like me, commuted from home to UCLA. And that's one way to reduce traffic. So the necessity is the mother of invention. Now the reason I tell that story is because Chuck Young could have told me to go fly a kite. <laughs> We're a state property, you don't have any jurisdiction. But he realized he, he didn't want to just alienate everybody around here, and he didn't want to alienate me. It wasn't so much alienating me, he didn't want to put me in a tough position. And, and so when we got to this meeting, his people, his traffic engineers said, Chancellor, we can't agree to that. We can't agree to it. And he turned to, the, in front of me, he turned to those, to his own traffic engineers and said, you've been telling me for six months that we can do that. Let's put your money where your mouth is, you know? And, and, <laughs> and it's, a, it's a tribute to his leadership. And that, that is what leadership is. It, it, sometimes it comes from the top down. And, uh, and so they figured it out. We'll build more housing and it'll reduce traffic and it'll allow us to expand the campus. And the rest, as they say, is history. It's a wonderful story. I wish I could say that I came up with this idea. It was totally, all I was trying to do is get the residents off my back. <laughs> you know, I needed to have something I could say to my, to my community. He actually took it seriously and his people then took it seriously. It's kind of like bass and homelessness. When the leader says, we're, this is, we're marching this way, and either you're on board or, you're, or get out of the way, uh, it has a real impact. And, uh, He's as good a public administrator as I ever met or worked with. Anyway, I love this campus, so I, <laughs> that, that wasn't the point. You didn't the ask me any of that. The only UC campus yeah. that guarantees housing. But it's I, a huge I, uh, I, I loved it here, and um, but I'm going to be 75 in 16 days. So, uh, and uh, my sister is don't. Is this being recorded? I better not tell you. She's older than I am. <laughs> and uh, I haven't spent more than a week with my sister in 30 or 40 years. And, uh, you know, I go to Europe, I'll stop in Israel. I go, go to do an election observation in the Republic of Georgia, I'll stop on the way back for four days. But I've never really spent a month with her since uh, the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, I'm not going to have that opportunity. Uh, there's not going to be that many more opportunities. So uh, Mark and I talked about this before the last academic year was over. And I haven't made a final decision. But at some point, I want to be able to do some of those things. And, um, but I, I, I hate the notion of, you know, of leaving this place. This, is, uh, this has been so in instrumental for me. It's a great, it's a great university. All right. Yes, yeah, sir. Let's make sure. You mentioned that before you there was uh, a good, very little representation of, uh, of Jewish leadership 
in Los Angeles, saying we have more Jewish people than Jerusalem, right? Uh, so, is it also true that there are places where Jewish people were not even allowed to reside, to live, such as in Monica, for example? I, I mean, in the research, I cannot find it, but I hear like, suffering Olympic tale, basically, about it. Are you familiar with these stories? Or is it true that, uh, like, let's say, Santa Monica, Jews were not allowed even to reside? To live? I, I don't know about Santa Monica, uh, but I do know. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the sordid history of, of uh, deed restrictions in, in uh, just across the country, but certainly in Los Angeles. There are places you can still see the deeds. Um, in Hancock Park, I mean, this is the interesting thing, is Hancock Park is now, the western part of Hancock Park is now ultra-Orthodox. <laughs> and when that first started to happen, it was culture clash. I mean, serious culture clash. It was almost violent. And... Uh, you know, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who dominated in the Hancock Park. And now you had these Orthodox Jews, Hasidic Jews. And, uh, and the guy who took up their cause was a good friend of mine, uh, Tim Rutten, an Irish Catholic, passed away about a year ago. Uh, used to be a columnist for the LA Times, edited the opinion section for many years. He's a great guy. <laughs> And he took on the cause of the of the Orthodox against the non-Jews and, uh, and and some of the non-Orthodox Jews. I said, "What I, what the hell are you doing, Tim? You're 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 picking a fight with 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 with, the, with your own people." And he says, "My own people are out to lunch on this." So uh, so Hancock Park was a place where you, where Jews were excluded. Bel Air was a place where Jews were excluded. I don't know about this area, uh, Westwood, the Jans. I know that they, they excluded uh, uh, blacks and uh, probably Asians. Uh, there, were, there were also some euphemism for Jews, you know, people of Eastern European descent, you know, that, that slips in there. There's a professor at the, there, there are a lot of professors around here who are experts more than I am. I'm not at all an expert on this. Uh, and I've learned a lot about this since coming back to, to campus, but Eric Avila, the history department, and some of the folks in the public policy uh, department in the public affairs school, the urban planning school uh, department. Uh, it, but I, I know from experience when people have showed me uh, the deeds, uh, and Eric Avila actually has a PowerPoint. I have him speak to my history class every year, and, and he, you know, he puts this this slide up on the on the projector, and it's. Uh, it, it, it shakes me up. I'm sure, I'm sure how it shakes up people of a younger generation. But yeah, it's true. And uh, and, and some some of the patterns of of uh, where the Jews moved was because of where they were permitted to buy real estate. So Fairfax was okay. Hancock Park, which is you know joined at the hip with Fairfax, not okay. Um, yeah. I don't know about Santa Monica. No, I represented it in the County Board of Supervisors, and okay. and I know it from a thirty thousand foot view. But I don't know the deed restriction history. It wouldn't surprise me if there were. I mean, it's it's interesting. The, the, the whole the the whole history of of housing discrimination is outrageous. Uh, I mean, there's a book that was written recently, uh, a few years ago, just before the pandemic, about uh, the Dodgers. But it was, it was the Dodgers, and I forget the name of the book. It's, I think the guy who wrote it was Michael Leahy, uh, who used to be a reporter for an old defunct magazine here in L.A. And it was, it, but it was about the history of this period seen through the eyes of the Dodgers. And one of the things that got my attention, since I'm a sports fan, and I certainly was a Dodger fan, is Tommy Davis, who was the most valuable player in the National League in 1962 or something like that, couldn't buy a house in Hancock Park. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Black Bel Air, as they call it, a park, a view park. Sure, yeah. Up, up above, you know, in the Baldwin Hills area, which used to be Jewish and, and, and then became Jewish and black. It was integrated in the 60s. That's where Tom Bradley first represented uh, the city and the city council. And, uh, yeah, and, and he built a coalition of blacks and Jews and other groups to, to get elected. He was the first person, first black ever elected to the city council. And, uh, and he did it by coalition building. Uh, so all of that, you know, that was an area where, where you, could, you could buy. The irony of what's going on now is that now it, it has, you know, this is where 
uh, Ray Charles lived and some of the, the big uh, African-American uh, you know, singers and composers and musicians because the view you get from View Park is the same view you get from Bel Air, except you're looking south from Bel Air and you're looking north from View Park. It's a gorgeous neighborhood. Uh, and what's happened now is because of gentrification, whites are moving into that neighborhood mm -hmm. and buying out uh, the diminishing black population of, of that area, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's sad. Uh, but it's, again, it's the natural order of things. But yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's part of our history, and, uh, and it has a lot to do with where these communities developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How gratifying was it to you when that the refusal movement worked prior to the end of the Soviet Union? Jews were, you know, shrinking. Yeah. I mean, they got out, and you went, you went to jail, and it, it had impact. Yeah. So it's an interesting question. Thanks for asking it. Uh, there was a guy who was in the Soviet jury movement part of our international ganglium, uh, a guy by the name of Michael Sherborne. And he was interviewed for the documentary movie called Refusenik, which I highly recommend. You can get it, you can actually get it on Netflix, I think, or, or even Netflix or YouTube. Uh, he was interviewed about this, and it was a movie made by a young woman uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, 2000, 2007 it came out. And he's interviewed and he says, when the wall came down, he says, I could hardly believe it. I never thought I'd live long enough to see it. And that's kind of the way I felt when, he, when I saw that interview. I, I said, that's, that's how I felt. I said, I never imagined that I'd live long enough to see the wall come down and, and the free emigration and that I would be able to go to my grandfather's birthplace in Belarus well, you can't go now. <laughs> well, I can't. Nor could you go to Ukraine. So. I, I, I could go now uh, if I was uh, amoral, but I. Right. But but you could you you couldn't go there in the Soviet days because it was off limits. Right. So only like fifty places where you could go, cities mainly. So and you could as long as you kept your mouth shut in uh, in, in Belarus, you could go anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. You rent a car. We rent the first time I went to Belarus, I went there twice. We went to Vilnius in Lithuania and then drove, rented a car to go to my grandfather's place. It's about, it would be an hour's drive, not including the four hours at the border. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I was, I mean, I just, uh, it never, I, I would have never bet a nickel on me living long enough to see. And the way it happened, it just, suddenly happened, it just collapsed. And the guy I give credit to uh, is, is uh, I mean, not full credit, uh, the credit goes to our country and the West and all, but Gorbachev had to make a, de a decision, do we invade or not invade? And he decided not to invade. And, uh, and I don't think he gets enough recognition for a very difficult decision. As a result, he ended up in, Oblivion in the Soviet system. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have we we have to, we have to go. go to okay. the reception. There's a, a full reception with food. I'm sorry to cut you off. And, um, let's give a round of applause to our incredible, okay. Okay. Thank you. incredible.